cat was walking horizontally or vertically here. But what is the mathematical inspiration? Well, if you have a cat, a cat, when you drop a cat, it always falls back on its feet, doesn't it? Can you agree on this? Okay. Most cases. <laughs> always, sorry. No? Could you ever? From the small uh, distance, uh, she cannot... Uh, small height, no, no. But you have to throw, really. Yeah. You have to do that. <laughs> okay. So, but if you have a piece of bread, and this is again in zero gravity, where they are doing some other tests to see what happens when a cat falls in zero gravity. But okay, we will not do this here. Uh, but the, the thing is, if you have a piece of bread and you put jam on it or chocolate and you, it falls, what happens? It always falls on the part where the jam is or the chocolate is, no? It's more Murphy law, it's not true. So, well, not anyway, true. I was trying to figure out what would happen if, because the paradox is, what, what happens if a cat, if you put butter or <laughs> chocolate on the back of a cat, would it fall on... You see, mathematicians are interested in these kind of questions because they look like mathematical paradoxes. Unfortunately, I cannot do this anymore because my cat is dead. So, these kind of things are the unusual things I normally do, like this demonstration. If you know the Yoshimoto cube, uh, it's a cube, you open it, and there's a star in there, and this star again transforms into a cube like this. You can actually easily download it, and you can uh, cut it out in paper and make it. Sometimes I bring these models and I do a show with this, but, well, they wanted something more calm this time, so uh, I do this then in black light, and everything is dark, and then I do this demonstration. You can also do this by unfolding objects, and then I put uh, a little puppet in the object as a kind of magic trick. Do you have these shows like uh, Serbia Got Talent or X Factor or do you have these things? Yes. Uh, I was to, supposed to participate in such a show on July the 5th with this thing here. But the dean of my university said that I would better not do it. <laughs> because he said it's not good for the image of the university. <laughs> so he actually forbid me. Somebody said that it's right, so... Okay. No, it is good for the image of the university. <laughs> but to for sure. In there. For and you are good. Well, but I couldn't... So, another thing is, this is something that's rather known in mathematical art things. If you have these sticks, and you cross these sticks, like this, actually you don't need the rubbers, they fit like that. There's a Japanese guy who does big, huge sculptures with it. Then you get a volume in between there. But you cannot really see what the volume is, because you have to guess what it is. So I asked my art students, my architects, how can we visualize it? Well, they said, we will put some light in there with straws, and then you can visualize it. But I said, no, it's not much better. The only thing we see is this. It's not good. So they thought a little bit further, and finally this student and this student, and this is somebody else, they uh, agreed on making this, and then when it's dark, then you can really see the intersection. So here, the artists found a solution for the problem of the mathematician who could not really see what the intersection is. I like this a lot, this thing here, because it was so convincing that you could see the intersection. Okay, perhaps you're thinking now, this guy is very quick to make him happy. It's very easy, but uh, This is uh, <coughs> another illustration I did, an unusual one with students, Papus theorem. Uh, I don't need to explain this to the mathematics teachers that you are, but in short, it's when you go from A to this point, to that point, to that point, to that point, to that point, and you turn back, then these intersections are all on one line. You can also do it like that. It always works, no matter how you choose these three points. Papus theorem. But mathematics, we do it on chalk with chalk on a board, or we do it on paper with a pencil, or perhaps we do it in the sand, like the Greeks did. But, Tom, uh, but um, Plato, he said that mathematics was something in the sky, and that we, on the earth, we see only the shadow of the ideas. You certainly know the metaphor of the cave of Plato. So mathematics should not be done by chalk, should not be done with a pencil, should not be done on a computer screen. Mathematics floats somewhere in space. So what did my, this, these students do? They said, well, let's illustrate it with laser light. Because when you have a laser, you don't see anything. If I switch, the only thing you see is the point there. So they said, well, let's illustrate. 
penetrated by the laser, and so they projected here these lines, and then suddenly, Star Wars, what you do? You are ready to, with a red laser, you are ready, you are ready to show they are all on one line.
I did was shortening it a little bit.
she has to wear a t-shirt then or she has to wear Fibonacci sleeves these are sleeves where uh, this is uh, 8, 5, you see Fibonacci numbers 1, 1, 2, uh, 3, 5, 8 uh, then uh, of course I participate in this because then I wear myself a Boromean tie see Boromean rings, Slavi Jablan talked about this this is a Boromean tie here you have one ring, there another ring and then another ring and the tie uh, this normally we don't use in live demonstrations <laughs> this is only for exams uh, this is a mathematical cooking show because I also have a mathematical but I don't know why the movie doesn't start again the same problem I don't know what I did wrong um, I will go to this part I'm oh, sorry I checked it so well and so uh, cooking with the uh, fractals and scrolls. It's like a regular cooking show, the video. Uh, I don't know how it is in Serbia, but in uh, Belgium, when you have a cooking show, the man cooks and he knows everything. And then besides him, there's always a pretty woman who doesn't do anything except asking stupid questions. <laughs> you have that? No. Okay. Well, there we did the opposite. There the show was, the man was the cook, and then the girl, played the role of the assistant, but she knew all the mathematics. So when the cook was saying, okay, I have a fractal here, then she is saying something, oh yes, fractals, so we know that, infinite repetition, always on a smaller scale, you have the fractal dimension, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so she does the opposite to, uh, well, in order to, as a little protest, fractal uh, broccoli they are preparing there with, uh, I don't know, with what sauce and so on. You see this, you, I think we know this. Huh? Yes, we know. Actually, on the family day, we will have a demonstration with this family tree, with, uh, with such a tree, Fibo, such a, a fractal tree. Uh, this is something else I also do. These are, because Belgium is known for the French fries. Well, everybody calls them French fries. <laughs> uh, but it should be Belgian fries, of course. I know, I know the French invented the fries. In the French invented the fries, that's true. The first fries were cooked on a bridge in Paris. But we made them popular eh, in Belgium. So what did we do there? There we are preparing uh, mathematical fries. I will try to explain what the idea is. Uh, perhaps I have a little slide about this, yes? So the idea is the following, and if you want to do this, we can do this on family day, if you want, but then I really need your, not only no, your assistant, uh, assistance, I also need potatoes. Uh, so normally, um, and also we, we also need grease and so on, but I think it would be very successful if we would be cook, cooking, cooking potatoes uh, down there. Normally, uh, this is how a knife to make uh, potatoes industrially looks like, no? Uh, you put the potato here, you push it through, I have this machine, and then here you have regular French fries. But what did we do? We have hexagonal fries. You see, it's a hexagon. And if you put the potato through it, then you have hexagonal fries. Why are hexagonal, hexagonal fries better? You should know it as mathematicians, because the circumference is less for the same um, transversal section surface. So, if the circumference is less, you have less grease. So they are healthier. <laughs> and experimentally, you could show that you have 17% less grease on hexagonal fries. So if you want, you can see that there we sometimes do this in schools and so on, and people are tasting it, you see the TV there, eh? how do the hexagonal fries taste, mm, yum, yum, they're so good, and so on. This is what the people are saying there. Uh, but of course, this, we have seen that this is not so successful, because the true spirit of people is they don't want healthy food. People want greasy food. Eh? So we have the L-shaped fries, you can see them here. If you put the potato through it, it's an L-shape, and you know from structural analysis and also in architecture, an L-shape is stronger. So it means that if you put it in your mouth, it's stronger. You have more taste. Also, the surface is bigger, so it's greased, fatter. Eh? And people prefer this. Actually, today, the person who did this, a friend of mine, he now has a new knife, and his newest, in newest invention is where the knives are arbitrary. Just arbitrary. Why? because in, he sold one of these knives to a chic restaurant in Paris, because then they can serve the fries as if they were made by hand. 
and they, then they are more expensive, while if they were done by machine. But they look arbitrary. Clever thinking. Eh? So if you want, we can do this on the family day. We can do the hexagonal fries in Belgrade. You see the knife there? And you see the explanation that I was just giving? I forgot that, that I had it. Of course, you could say circle of fries would be better. Yes. You could say, but then you have too much loss here. What do you do with this? You can make mashed potatoes out of that, but you have too much loss. So in fact, the hexagonals are better. Uh, then it says 10%. Yes, it is 10% if you just compute the fat, but you gain an extra 7 because you have to cook them less long than the others because the surface is less. L fries. So I also do the golden taste. <clears throat> you know what the golden number is? 1.618. Uh, if you have um, something to put on the fries, whatever, uh, salt, eh? uh, if the holes are open, it's 100%. You can determine what is 100% taste. If they are closed, it's 0%. If it's half open, it's 50%. 50% of the salt that you... 100% is at the time when you say, oh no, this I cannot eat anymore, it's totally salt. This is what you call 100%. So, half open is 50%. This is another way to say 50%. It's the same thing, but you can also work with two discs. If you work with two discs, it's easier to say, for instance, imagine that you have to eat a steak with fried potatoes, and you want to distribute the salt. What can you do? You want, for instance, 50% on the fried potatoes, and you want 50% of 50% on the steak. Then you will have, here you will have 50% and 75% for each half. So that means, 37.5% spice. I will go a bit quickly over this. If you use the golden number, you put 0.618. These are, this is the decimal part of the golden number, 1.6. And if you take 0.618 or 0.61, you have 38% that you can put on the meat, on the steak. Now, if you add that, you have 61 plus 30.2, that's 100%. So then it's evenly distributed. So the idea is that if you put a golden section distribution on the french fries and the square of the golden section on the steak... Okay, I'm being too long here. You're waiting for the balloons. I will do that. <laughs> uh, chocolate. This is something else we did. Uh, chocolate, uh, chocolates normally chocolates are square in a box, but what happens when you have a chocolate box with squares? They break easily. Squares or rectangle of chocolates. They break easily, so they have to make them thicker. Otherwise, they break too easily. But if you would use a hyperboloid, like here, a hyperboloid is structurally stronger, so they can be thinner. Ah! So, in the shop here, you see my students selling hyperboloid chocolates. Uh, this was a big work, actually. We needed six students to do this. You see here all these students, because the first year it didn't work and so on. I also did the... Uh, 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 praline, de praline. Do you say this in Serbian? Yes. De yes. praline. Okay, because in France they don't say that. In France they say de bonbon. So uh, yeah. uh, that's why they're French. Uh, so uh, de praline. But what I did was not de praline, but de piraline. <laughs> and what are piraline? I will tell you. This is a poster I made where three is orange, one is red, four is yellow. So three, one, four, the number pi. Eh? 3.1415926535789835642 or something like that. I think I'm wrong now. So with this friend uh, who has a chocolate shop in Bruges, that's the two students sitting here visited. And what is your opinion about this chocolate shop? It was amazing. Yeah, thank you. Okay, they visited it during their visit in uh, Belgium, and you heard their opinion. Yeah, I did already enough. Okay. So, uh, in this chocolate shop, you can see him uh, making, what is he doing here? He is making uh, decimals of pi, three, one, four numbers. And the three is filled with one taste. The three is filled, for instance, with banana. The one is filled with uh, cookies. The four is filled with rum. So, when you eat the decimals of the number pi, three is banana, one is cookies, four is... Uh, Fondant, eh? and then again there is a one, so that's again the cookies. So since the decimals of pi are randomly distributed, this is an unproven theorem, by the way, uh, since they are probably randomly distributed, 
um, you are sure that the taste in your mouth will always and ever change. <clears throat> so you are sure that you have an infinite uh, taste adventure. Okay. Uh, this is something else I did, an ice cream, uh, and there should be a movie there, but I must have saved it in the wrong version. Oh, it's again the chocolate movie, this is not possible. Uh, what did I do wrong? So, this one here, um, I will use this. Okay, this is a, a theorem in uh, geometry. Uh, where if you have a sphere and another sphere and they are cut by a plane, imagine that the intersection is an ellipse. It also works for a parabola or a hyperbola. Here you have the two foci and this focus will touch this sphere exactly in this focus. So the sphere will touch the ellipse in the focus. This sphere will touch the ellipse in the other focus. So the idea was now, as you can see there, this is where I live. I live at the beach. I live at, my house is at level minus one, <coughs> under sea level. This is why I'm such a negative person. <laughs> okay, humor. <laughs> but I become immediately more positive when I go to my bedroom, because my bedroom is at level plus one. Okay. So the idea was, can we do this ice cream with a cookie here, a biscuit? And here we have an ice sphere, and here another ice sphere. So this is something I did on the beach with Miss Belgium, as you can see there. Why was Miss Belgium there? I thought this would be good. <laughs> so, and she was there to eat the ice cream. Yes, I just copied what they do for cars. No? Don't you see this for cars? For cars, well, there's always a pretty woman near to the car. And then they say it helps to sell the car. A clean car. Eh? Isn't it? They, no, they don't clean the cars. They're, they, are, they are meant for that. <laughs> so I said, well, I can sell mathematics in the same way. And this is, was my idea. So I just copied it and we did it with... Uh, actually, this represents Belgium. If you I don't know how far I can go, we should start with balloons because the yellow, these are the Flemish and the, these are the French-speaking people. And this is the language border. And the whole story about it that I will not... Perhaps we'll go into detail. This is a, also, you can also do it with cylinders instead of, and then you have the tennis equivalent. Because a few years ago, Belgium was rather famous for tennis with Kim Kleisters. I don't know how you pronounce her name, and Justine Henin. Hmm? Yes, so this was another illusion that you can do it with tennis balls. And I even showed it, it was even shown to Queen Paola of Belgium. And the title was Vive le Théorème Belge. Long live the Belgian theory. Because this theorem, about uh, this theorem here is known as the Belgian theorem. Belgium is the only country that has a theorem. <laughs> there is no American theorem, there is no French theorem, but if you go to Google and you type theorem Belgium, you will find it. <laughs> okay, enough. We have to go to the balloons. Uh, ah yes, this is a little dream I have. A uh, little dream about my can you see here what happens here? You see that you see here that zero corresponds to C, one to C cross, two to D, and so it means that every note corresponds to this small of the number five. And still, although it should be totally arbitrary, you get some nice music. This is what I call music. Why music? Thank 
I'm not quite sure what it proved, but it was, it was hard to look at. It's just some mad professor from Ghent. I'm so lucky. And that was me. Yeah. And so people were so surprised. And actually, for the runners, it was very difficult. Because normally they run like this. And then they had to run like this. And they were very good, these runners. They were top. They, one of them participated in the Olympics. So, and he explained, he didn't win, although he was the fastest runner. Because he was so not used to running this distance. And the person who won was the youngest one. Because he was not misformed like the others. I will also not talk about the fact that mathematics, in fact, is not halal. I will not do that. Although you see one of my students trying to ride on a bicycle in a burqa. Actually, they also do this in Iran. It's not for fun. It's a true story. I will not also I will not talk about the fact that the forbidden fruit in... Uh, what do you think is the forbidden fruit of paradise? What do you think is the forbidden fruit of paradise? What do you think? Forbidden fruit of paradise? What did eat Eva eat? An apple, everybody says an apple, but I discovered that it was a lemon. Together with Beatrix uh, Meiji from Hungary, we discovered that on this painting, it's a particular kind of lemon called the Pomundadami. If you want to know more about that, please ask me. I will not talk about errors in the work of Leonardo da Vinci. Why would I not do that? Because here you see a bridge. And this bridge was shown in all the exhibitions, in a traveling exhibition from Australia to the America to Brussels. And when they came in Brussels, I wanted to do a TV uh, show about this exhibition, but they didn't allow me to get in. We had to do the TV show on the steps of the museum, because I said bad things about that. Because this bridge, look look at this bridge. The pillars do not go to the ground. They, it's as if the pillars, they want to hang themselves. They, they, they're saying, I'm flying, I'm flying. They're pulling their own hair. You see, they don't go into the ground. This model makes no sense. So I said this in the TV report, and the organizers were not happy. They called my dean, and my dean said, Mr. Malbrook, come here. And uh, they, there was a movie about this TV show on the website of the university. And then they called me, Dirk, we have to remove the movie. I said, what I was saying is right, no? Even the dean said it's right. My dean is an architect. He immediately understood that this is, makes no sense. I said, yes, yes, you are right, Dirk. said, okay, so then the movie should stay, because what I'm saying is correct. I'm saying that this is wrong. Yes, yes, but we will remove the movie. He said, no, what I say is right, so it should stay. No, they said, they have a lot of money. So it was removed for that reason. The Atomium in Belgium, if you go there, you will see another mistake. You will see that it's covered by a hexagon, which is not a regular hexagon like this yellow one, but it's cut like this, and there is a square which is not a square, and there is a rectangle which is not a rectangle, on one sphere. Why is it on one sphere? There are nine spheres in this monument that everybody visits in Brussels, and on the last sphere, before the opening, they quickly covered everything because the politicians wanted to open the building the next day. So they quickly covered it, and they never came back. So we said, I said that the uh, atomium in the TV news was as cute as the Tower of Pisa. Yeah. And the director, when they were filming, they said, okay, Mr. Director, what do you think of this? And he blah, 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 blah. And then, ah, and there is Mr. Holbrook. What do you think of this? And they turned the camera to me. And then the director of the museum, he, he saw me, he said, ah, it's you, it's you, it's you, Mr. Holbrook. We will see each other again. We will see each other on Wednesday. Prepare your lawyer. We will see each other in court. <laughs> he was not happy. He was not happy. He was very angry. I never saw him. Actually, he did this, everything in French, because he spoke yeah. French. <laughs> and since he didn't speak Dutch, he didn't understand what I said, he thought one of the spheres of the atomium was falling on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and since he didn't understand the language, he, he consulted the whole press and said to the whole press, like that. Also, I did something about the airport in Brussels. Airport in Brussels 02 has a number. And uh, maybe I should start the balloons. I see that some people have a number of it. Should I start the balloons? No. Uh, no. Mr. Takachi, should I start with the balloons? Maybe I have the tendency of overdoing it, I know it, so I have to be warned. If I'm exaggerating, you have to tell me. Then we immediately start. No, no, no. In, in Brussels airport, uh, it's, the number is 02, because the angle with the North Pole, the magnetic North Pole, is 20 degrees. Air, uh, runways on airports are oriented following the magnetic North Pole. This is the North Pole, 20 degrees. So they call it 02, because this is 020. From the other side, it's 18 then, because 180 plus, then it's 20, so 20 plus 180. 
So it has the number 20 because of the 20 degree orientation, but the magnetic north pole uh, travels around, it changes. So I had found in the report of a crash buoy that the orientation is now 14 degrees. So that the number should be 01, because if you round it off, 14 is 01. So I wrote a paper in the newspapers about the wrong number of the airport of Brussels. <laughs> yes, they didn't find it so funny. Uh, but, and for five, six years, they didn't want to change it. And I always made a joke, how can you know that you're flying above Belgium in an airplane? Well, like this pilot, wrong number. This must be Belgium. <laughs> but finally, I wrote a book about these things, three actually. And when my book appeared, I got a call from the airport of Brussels, and they said, Mr. Halbrook, you will change the number. <laughs> so, on September 19th, they changed the number. <laughs> they had enough of it. Uh, okay, so this was good actually. I will not talk about the Shangorots, the oldest objects in mathematics. I will not do that. I will not talk about mat paranormal mathematics. It's something I did in Antwerp with this uh, paranormal guy. It's, some people believe in paranormal things and so on. So we did the whole show with a mathematical formula to compute how paranormal somebody is. So you have to hold something. And then for, for some people, it starts to move. Eh? Not because they move their hands, but because of their brain waves. And so then I compute the frequency eh, of the pendulum and so on. And then also they have to sing like I compute the frequency. I put this in a formula, as you can see there. Why are there logarithms? This is just to show up. Why is there a big square root? It's to make it complicated. Yes. It has totally no sense. But the day after, people phoned me to know the formula. <laughs> and I have to tell them, I told them, together with the magician who was involved with me, uh, we agreed that we would not tell the formula because it could endanger the world. <laughs> this is something I did in uh, Belgium too. This is an artwork, Fibonacci artwork, 100,000 euros it cost it. It's in Belgium. There you can see one, one, uh, three, uh, three plus, two plus three is five, five plus three is eight, eight plus five is 13, 13 plus eight, 21, 21 plus 13 is 34. Everything goes well, but what did I notice? Here you have 1,097. Here you have 2,000, and this is not the sum. <laughs> so this is wrong, all this part here. And this person, this person who made this uh, artwork of 100,000 euros, uh, when the mayor of this city, when I wrote this in the newspapers, the mayor of this city said that he should repair it immediately. <laughs> and the artist said, I never got any money. And then the mayor said, yes, he got all the money. Here's the proof from the bank. And then he said, Mr. Halbrook, you, you can find it on the internet, what he said. <laughs> I will not talk about the fact that actually Hungary, uh, Congo should have been Hungarian. I will not do that. Here's the proof. If you want more information about this, it's actually because the wife of King Leopold of Belgium, who took Congo as a colony, was from Hungary. She was Maria Hendrika. She was born in Pest. I will not talk about Alan Turing. Alan Turing was a mathematician who, after whom is called the Turing Prize in computer science. And he was actually well, a mathematician. He was actually a pure mathematician, although he's now cataloged to be a computer scientist. Right? But he worked on Zeta and so on. And uh, here's a statue for him. And you can see that this statue seems to weep, like some Maria statues, because it was made of different kinds of metals. And why did he weep? Because he should have been a war hero a hero of the war against uh, Germany because he broke the code of the Germans with his Enigma machine, the Enigma code. And he should have been a hero, but he committed one crime, which was a big crime in his time. He was homosexual. So because of his homosexuality, he had to be condemned to chemical castration. He refused it and so on. Long story, he committed suicide. Some people say he was uh, poisoned by MI5, but we will never know. But anyway, after a while, uh, there was a petition in a paper in the Mathematical Intelligence to honor this hero, who should have been a hero. And Brown, who was then Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, after this petition and after this paper and so on, he said, yes, I will honor him, I will remove his condemnation, and he will say that he was a hero of Great Britain. The next government, Cameron, he said, no, we will not do this because they are more conservative. And he said that once condemned, you are condemned forever. But finally, 
the Queen of England said, okay, yes, we will say he's a hero. Hooray for the Queen of England. Okay. I will not talk about the head of a French speaking mathematician in Antwerp. I will not do that. Uh, I will not talk about the zero gravity. I will not talk about the wheels that are constructed in the wrong way somewhere in Belgium. I will not talk about mathematics through a beer glass. You know, some pe several people here have talked about uh, illusions. Uh, optical illusions. I like optical illusions through a beer glass. I don't know why. <laughs> if I drink a lot of beer, I have a lot of illusions. Okay, uh, here, ice cream with Miss Belgium. I'm going to talk about it. Botticelli in Hungary. I have also discovered an error in, of mathematics in a talk by our king of Belgium. <laughs> I even offered him to give him math classes, mathematics class, for free. <laughs> Yeah, not a sense of humor, so I didn't do that. Uh, this is something I did in cycling. I will not talk about that because cyclists always turn like this. It's like what I showed in the memorial. So if they would, would cycle like this, it would be better. Why would it be better? Because the sponsor, if they cycle like this, you read Otto, 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 instead of Lotto. So if they would go in the same way, you would read Lotto. The sponsors were very happy. This is something I did in December, last December. Uh, something, oh, it's Stroma, the mathematics of Stroma, it's now translated in German. This is why I started with Stroma in the beginning of my talk. If you type Mathematique Stroma or my name is Stroma, you will find something about the mathematics of Stroma. Uh, even Stroma liked this, his manager wrote me. <laughs> uh, I will not talk about this, I will stop it. Uh, I will go to my topic, not, I will not talk about this. Oh yes, the Da Vinci Code with his sister here, that was funny. <laughs> this is also funny. You know, there's a roundabout in Belgium that turns the wrong way. You have to turn this way instead of this way. <laughs> and I wrote to the Minister of Public Transport and so on, and, and the police and so on, everything. It's a... Uh, uh, this is something I did. Well, you were there. Eh? Because this chick here, it's a publicity for Red Bull. And so it sips a little bit of this magic drink and it says P pi, the number pi, is equal to 3.14159. So what did I do? I called Red Bull and I said, Dear Red Bull, you're a little bit wrong because P goes on and on. You need more decimals. <laughs> or you have to. Eh? So I said, Okay, what will I do? I give you two options, or I write a paper in the newspapers called The Wings of Red Bull Cut Off, or you offer me 314 cans of Red Bull for free for my university. They choose for the second option, and they were there, they did it, actually did it in five places, at five universities they offered 314 free Red Bulls. <laughs> okay, I will not talk about this, this is my name. Theorem, I will prove that my name is equal to pi. As you can see, I have three first names. So D, G, A, so that's three point. And if A is one, B is two, C is three, then my name is one, four, one. So my name is 3.14. Okay, my bank account, I already said this. This is a repetition now because I didn't intend to do this talk, actually. I want to do the balloons. This is my signature. As you can see, when I was a little nerd, I had to design a signature. This is the axiom of Euclid. Parallel lines cut with angles that are equal or supplementary. Okay. <laughs> this is my car, as I told you. My garden, selling slices, SOSP. This was uh, something I did in a bakery shop. Normally they ask you, do you want a round bread or a square bread? And I said on Pi Day that we should discuss about the squaring the circle. This is my preferred hotel room number, 314. Selling, yes, this is my official, official picture at the University of Leuven. You know, <laughs> I could smuggle this in. Nobody noticed because it's a big university. Eh? So nobody noticed I'm there like a criminal with the number 31415. Uh, this is my uh, Facebook site, the Pi Light Zone. Uh, you can become friends, but it's rather difficult because I have 314 friends. And uh, if you want to be, if I have to accept a new friend, I have to throw somebody else off, defriend somebody. So I have 314 friends. 
This I show because uh, Ilona did a uh, which no Ilona is giving a workshop. This is something about that Ilona did. If you have this picture and you do this subdivision, you can do this like what Ilona did uh, yes. with the um, tongue ground things uh, yes. yesterday. And uh, what happens is you can do it with this subdivision too, but then a square will disappear. So what you do when I was teaching this to my students, they said, well, we glue this picture on this side and the same picture at the other side. And then the square will disappear. <laughs> the teacher disappears. <laughs> so you can see that some of my students have a sense of humor. They have a way to make the teacher disappear. Uh, professor, no professor, okay. This is how my students bury me with a gum on a calculator. Uh, this is what a drawing that I caught one student making during class. <laughs> Supai man. <laughs> okay, yes, somebody gets it, okay. Uh, I did 12 years in Africa, and at a certain time in Africa, they put me in prison, <laughs> in a hut and so on. I said, okay, how is this going to end? Because there were some rebels there. And suddenly somebody came in and he said, oh no, I know this guy, he has a red motorcycle. I said, okay. And he said to his, uh, to his chief, because they always move their gun first, eh, to make a good impression on their chief. Eh? But you can, he can go, he's not dangerous, he's a mathematician. <laughs> so this I very much appreciate because it's, I think it's one of the very rare opportunities where as a mathematician, you are considered to be non-dangerous. Normally, it's schools are different. Because I also taught for Americans in, uh, in Germany, the GIs. And uh, once I had a student, Kenny Green was his name. And Kenny Green came to me and said, Sir! I don't know, these people, they always shout. <laughs> Sir! I said, yes. <laughs> uh, I said, I need three promotion points. I have 18 points now, and I need three promotion points to become a surgeon. To become a sergeant. I said, yes, okay, what can I do? Yes, he said, if I follow your math class, I have four promotion points. If I go to Iraq, I have seven promotion points. So he said, sir, what would be more dangerous to follow your next math class or to go to Iraq? He didn't come to my next class. <laughs> so maybe this is the reason why the people like to make jokes about mathematics, because people are afraid, for instance, of the opposite sex of homosexuals, they are afraid of foreigners, they are afraid of other religions, and this is for many people a source of humor. I don't like this source of humor. I will not do that. I will give you one example of a bad humor joke about mathematicians. Do you know what is the difference between an extravert and an introvert mathematician? An extrovert mathematician will look at your shoes when he is talking to you. It's a difficult because normally mathematicians talk like this and they look at their shoes <laughs> because they are so timid. But normally a mathematician who is open-minded, he looks at your shoes. <laughs> so these jokes we don't like. That. Actually, I appreciate it that you didn't laugh. It was very good because these are bad jokes. So we will not do that because these are negative jokes about mathematics. And this is a lack of inspiration. If you have to make jokes about Muslims, about foreigners and so on, it means that you're not creative enough. So we will not do that. So what kind of jokes will we make? Well, first let's see our sources. Sources for mathematics humor, there's for instance this book by John Allen Powers, and there he gives his favorite joke. The favorite joke of this guy is, what hangs on a wall is green, wet, and whistles, says the father to his son. The son says, I don't know. The father says, well, a herring. A herring is a kind of fish. He says, well, a herring. He says, but yes, he says the son, a herring doesn't hang on the wall. Yes, said the father, but you can hang it there. You can nail it on the wall. Oh, says the son, but the herring is not green. Yes, says the father, but you can paint it green. Oh, says the son, but the herring is not wet. Yes, he says, but if you just painted it, it will be wet. Oh, says the son, but the herring doesn't whistle. Sure, says the father, that is true. This is something I added to make it difficult. <laughs> so this is kind of a joke that uh, they prefer, mathematicians prefer, because for them, mathematics and humor they are both like intellectual games, eh, where you have to think, oh, what is humorous about this? This is the kind of jokes that I will try to quote here in the story, and that we will do. Uh, another example is, there was a prisoner who played cards with his guards, and once the prisoners started cheating, so what did they do? They kicked him out. Okay, difficult one. 
there's a woman and a husband, the mathematician, and the woman asks, how long should grass be mowed? That means to cut the grass. Huh? How long? And the mathematician's answer, as long as short grass. <laughs> okay? Uh, woman, why don't you give up smoking for me? Says the mathematician. How do you think that I smoke? Why do you think that I smoke for you? <laughs> okay, not so good. Uh, when leaving a cafe, there's a pigeon, a bird, and put some caca, some poop <laughs> on the head of a mathematician. Says the woman, oh, wait, wait, I will go for some toilet paper in the cafe. Says the mathematician, don't do that effort. The pigeon is far away. <laughs> uh, the woman says to the mathematician, go buy some bread in the supermarket, and if there are eggs, a dozen. The mathematician come back, comes back with 12 breads. Okay. Uh, these are some examples from that book. Let's go to some more sources. A woman wants perfume with computer smell for her husband. Uh, these are some obscenities in toilets. I didn't check here at the Belgrade Metropolitan University what they write on the toilet walls. But this is, you see, division by zero. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, this is from a German book. This is something I really like. It's very recent. I have to translate this because it's in German. It says, and he says, uh, you play music now. And the, German, the other says, yes. And he says, and what? What do you play? He says, quartet. I think it's an international word, quartet. Oh, he, said, he says, how many of you are there? He answers, three. <laughs> and who is it? He answers, me and my brother. And he says, have you a brother? No. <laughs> okay, I don't, I don't know why I find it so funny. Uh, this is from Galvin and Hobbes, uh, where they say this is more for elementary school. These jokes, if you have this cartoon, he says, for instance, that he has to be excluded because he doesn't believe in mathematics and there's a freedom of religion in the US, so he shouldn't do any mathematics. Uh, this is from The Simpsons. By the way, in The Simpsons, there's a lot of mathematics. Why? Because the producer is somebody who has a PhD in mathematics from Harvard. And one of the scenario writers of The Simpsons has a PhD from Yale University. There is a book by Simon Singh, The Mathematics of The Simpsons. So this is an easy one, pi, and he thinks about pi. Uh, but here there is p and not p, uh, so the letter p. And uh, this is more involved, so they put little messages in the Simpsons. This I should do the balloons, and this is what you are saying. Oh. <laughs> so this is another here one, two mathematics, mathematics for dummies at this, this will be $15. Okay. <laughs> uh, did you divide by zero? Okay. These are Fibonazzi's. I will explain this. One, or I should not show this. One, eh? one, two, three, do you get it? Eh? Five, eight, and then 15, <laughs> uh, sorry, 13 Fibonazzi's. This is the Batman curve. There's also a love curve, but I will not show this here. <coughs> I will not do that. <laughs> but you can't do that. So that. One, two, three, I have no idea. Four, five, five, six, what do you want? What would be the fix? Seven, eight, nine, time is no longer mine. The teacher, 10, 11, 12, you're great, you know it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> this is studying maxima and minima. <laughs> you see, it's in different languages. This is in Flemish, this is in, I don't know. Uh, this is something I get on uh, Facebook, uh, by Twitter. You have to cook it at 120 degrees. <laughs> uh, a question on a talk. What does it fit? Mathematical biology, a PhD in math theoretical mathematics, and statistics of a big pizza. What does it fit in this row? The answer is a PhD in theoretical mathematics, because with all the rest, you can feed a family of four. <laughs> this is why sometimes you can hear plumbers in Belgium Sometimes there are Serbian mathematicians who come to Belgium and then they work as plumbers because they cannot get the quality of their degree. And you can hear them discuss about integrals and so on and while doing the plumbing. <laughs> so, and other people sit at the street and they say, I will do mathematics problems for a coffee. So, how does it come that mathematics really should be fun, fun, fun? Wasn't mathematics a serious business? How comes? Why are we apparently agreeing that mathematics is a fun activity? Well, in the 1960s, this was a mathematical question. A peasant sold potatoes for 
The cost was four-fifths of the price. What is the profit? This was a mathematical question in 1960. The times have changed. Since 1970, in modern mathematics, the farmer said, we take a collection pool of potatoes, and you put dots, and you draw a set for the elements of the brr, the profit set, and you compute the cardinal number of brr. In 1980, it was an agricultural entrepreneur, and he sells potatoes for ten dollars. The cost are eight dollars, and the profit is two dollars. What was the question? Yes. Underline the word potatoes. <laughs> and discuss opinions with your colleagues in your study group. 1990, the agricultural entrepreneur sells potatoes for ten point zero zero dollars because in 1980 the Iron Curtain had just fallen between the East and the West, and we suddenly became all super capitalists. So everything had to be in dollars point zero zero, and the cost for point eighty, and the program potato had to be run on your calculator, and you have to analyze it what it will become in the real world, what the applications will be in the real world of economics, because of course the only application, the only usefulness of mathematics is to become rich as soon as possible. If mathematics is beautiful, that has no that has no sense, has no meaning. The only goal of life is to become rich as soon as possible. This was 1980. 2000? I see that you're not laughing with this. This is very good. Huh? <laughs> in fact, it's not funny. Huh? But this is the way how it was. In 2000, the agricultural entrepreneur sells potatoes. Then everything was on the internet. You had to consult the internet, international potato company and read the profits. In the year 2005, there were no farmers anymore. <laughs> oh, yes, well. And uh, so they imported potatoes for 10 euros and they sold them for 8 euros. And then they funded this by a bank loan of two euros. This is how uh -huh. it happened. And then mathematics is useful because you use negative numbers to explain that you have a profit. Oh yes, our company is doing very well. We have a company, we have a profit of minus two. <laughs> In uh, 2010, there are no farms anymore, but you have heard of the bank crisis, there are no banks anymore. <laughs> so what you do, you change the school playground into a vegetable garden and uh, you grow your own potatoes. Uh, you keep 8 kilograms and you sell 2 kilograms as a profit. In 2020, no farmers, no banks. Oh, no, schools, yes, but you cannot grow potatoes anymore because of the global warming. Everything has become a desert. So the only thing you can do in 2020 is to look TV in front of your TV screen and the only thing you can do is to become a couch potato. This is an expression they use in English because you eat chips and you become a couch potato. And what you do, you look on mathematic, to mathematical shows on TV, and everything on TV has to be fun, 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 isn't it? On TV, you never think, in Belgium at least, you don't think. It should be fun, 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 and you should. So this is how mathematics had to become fun, 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 and we will now give an overview of mathematics in a fun, fun way. This is what we will do now. Two zeros, we start with the numbers. Huh? Two zeros are walking in the street. Suddenly, they see the number eight at the other side of the street. Sends one zero to the other. Who? Oh, what a nice belt she has. No. Uh, sorry, first, maybe in English it's easier to understand. Okay, I start again. Two zeros are walking in the street. Suddenly, they see the number eight at the other side. Sends one zero to the other. Oh, she has anorexia. Better? Teenager girls. Two zeros are walking in the street. Suddenly, they see the number eight at the other side. Adult version. Says one to the other, don't look, don't look, they're doing it on the street. <laughs> Grandmother version. Two zeros are walking on the street. Suddenly, they see the number eight at the other side. Says one zero to the other. Oh, look, Siamese twins. <laughs> this is for the number zero. Now we go to the number one. Madame Einstein, you know her better than you can pronounce it better than I do. At some time, she, she co-invented a device to measure electric streams and they asked her, why is the certificate of the invention only on the name of your husband, Albert Einstein? Well, Milena said, it doesn't matter because Albert and me, we are Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's funny, but I like this. This joke you have in different versions. Some people say, why could Milena and Einstein never build a house? Because they had only one Stein and stone. At the beginning of the world, there were two ones, and they met each other, and they fell in love, and this is how the numbers grew. They married, they were happy, they had a child, 
and they wanted to call it the number two, but they couldn't because there were three of them. Okay. <laughs> uh, this you can also uh, illustrate in knot theory for Slavic Jablo, Slavic and Yana and so, who are specialized in knot theory. If you have one knot, one knot, uh, if you represent numbers by knots, what happens if you put one knot and one knot together? You have three knots, so one plus one is three. Okay. Uh, this, of course, is not true in Tibet, because for the Dalai Lama, everything is one. <laughs> okay, perhaps this humor doesn't work because it's too soft. Maybe you're thinking this is for children. So let's level up a bit to real American style. Skip teenagers. Skip teenagers, yes. We go immediately to fear and sex. So for you, for you, what comes between fear and sex? Can you tell me? Between fear, between fear and sex, what is in between? Can you tell me? Because you want to skip the teenager thing. Oh, well, I'll tell you what comes between fear and sex. Here it is. Fünf, ein, zwei, drei, vier. Fünf, sechs. Can I ask you not to cheat? Because I saw somebody was helping the lady there and was showing this. And this is very nice. So, uh, another thing for you again. Why did five eat six? Do you know? Why seven, did five? Seven, eight, nine. Seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Please an applause for this lady. It's very good. So we have all the digits from zero to nine. Okay, mathematics starts with these digits. So there was somebody in the company and he wanted to hire somebody who could tell who could count well. And he counted the first candidate and he said, he said can you tell me to count to ten? He says, oh, of course. One, three, five, nine, two, four, six, eight, ten. Says the, the human resource manager says, why can't you count, count normally? Why do you count like that? Yes, he said, I used to be a postman. <laughs> okay, he said, okay, let's count the next one. He calls the next one, he says, oh, can you count to ten? I need somebody who can at least count. And he comes in and he says, well, yes, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 3, 2, 1. He says, oh, goodness, can't you count normally? I need somebody who can just count. Oh, yes, well, what happens? I used to work with the NASA. <laughs> <laughs> he comes the next one. He says, okay, can you count from to 10? And he starts, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, oh, he says, finally, finally, I discovered somebody who can tell. Can I ask you, could you perhaps go on a little bit? Oh, yes, he said, sure. Uh, queen, uh, king. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we have all the numbers, and uh, now we have to work with them. I don't know how it is here in Serbia, because here the religion is orthodox for the majority, but in Belgium we have many Catholic schools. And do you know that in Catholic schools, they teach addition better than in the non-Catholic schools? And I will tell you why. Because once there was a boy, and the boy, he went to school, and he didn't do his additions. He came back home, and he looked at me, and said, it's not interesting. Next day he came back, he didn't do his own. So his parents said, okay, we'll put him in a Catholic school. They put him in a Catholic school, the boy comes back in the evening, he starts doing two plus three is five, five plus six is thirteen, working all day, all night, he doesn't look at TV anymore. So the parents, wow, Catholic education is very good. Okay, next day, same thing. Finally, they asked the little boy, how comes? What changed your mind? Oh, he said, well, yes, in this Catholic school, we have to work very hard. Because once there was somebody who didn't do his homework with the sons, and they put him on a big plus sign at the back of the class. <laughs> X squared asked X to the third, do you believe in God? X to the third says, no, but I do believe in higher powers. <laughs> Why does the square never move? Because it's fixed to, with its square root. Okay, we have the operations, uh, multiplications, roots, and so on. And let's see here how they do it in America. The mathematics. And twenty-five percent divided between the five of us. Gita, Crowbar, myself, Tom, and the baby. That makes five percent for each one of us. Ha ha ha, Billy, you're cheating yourself. If there's twenty-five percent divided among the five of you, that's fourteen percent apiece. Oh no, listen, Bob. I, I wouldn't cheat you. You know I wouldn't. Now look, look here. I'll show you. Let me run this out here. And now twenty-five. Divided by five is five. You see, you, the five won't go into two, will it? No. But five goes into twenty-five. The five times difference. You're wrong, Billy. Really. But that's now, not now, the I'm pretty good mathematician. Now, five into twenty-five. Five won't go into two, will it? No. But five goes into five once. 
Now, we didn't use the two before, so we're playing down here. Now, five into 20 goes four times. There you are. Five into 25, 14. No, look, Ma. Uh, let me prove it to you now by multiplication. Uh, five times five. Five times five is 25. I'm surprised you're learning. Huh? I'm surprised that you're learning. Now I'll show you. Uh, five times 14 is 25. Five times four is 20. Five times one is five. One <laughs> is five. That's it. No, no, look, Ma. Yeah. You, you, look, you, you're wrong there because you, I'll, I'll prove it to you. I'll, we'll put down four, five fourteens here. Fourteen, fourteen, fourteen. There. Now, now I'll prove to you by addition that the five fourteens is not twenty-five. Four, eight, twelve, sixteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, <laughs> twenty-four, twenty-five. I have an exercise for you. It also works with 14 times 7. Uh, so, um, yes. Uh, the indicate cut allows us to introduce other numbers, as you know. So these were the multiplication and so on. Uh, with non-repeating decimals, like the number pi and so on, the dedicant cut, but <coughs> maybe you are very interested. You want to cut the teenager thing, but we have to be a bit polite, so I put the black but for you, maybe I should show it anyway. <laughs> so, delicate cut. <coughs> okay, she said, I want to cut a delicate haircut. You expected something else. <laughs> I know that. Uh, anyway, we have uh, an infinite construction of decimals. And once, this is very inspiring for mathematicians because once there was a mathematician who had enough of life. And he saw the railways and he says, These railways, they meet each other there, and I will go there. I will go to the end of the world. He had a bottle of whiskey and he said, look, 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 this world, really. I will go there, to the end of the world. I will go there. Look, look, look. He says, really, this world has no meaning. I will go there. Huh? But his bottle of whiskey was empty. He throws it over his shoulder and he says, oh, I already passed it by. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he didn't tell it too well. There was also a mathematician and an engineer and they were allowed to approach a naked woman who was standing there always to half of the distance that separated them from the naked woman. And the mathematician says, this has no meaning. We will never approach her because the half of the half of the half, you can go on like this. It will not, we will never approach her. You can go on to infinity. But the engineer says, it doesn't matter. Soon enough, we will be close enough for all practical purposes. <laughs> Numbers for the number, jokes about the number pi. You know that 3.14% of all sailors are pirates? Uh, this is about pizza. I already said because I didn't intend to do this talk. Uh, here you see the wife of pi who is complaining that uh, he goes on with his decimals and so on. Now I should tell you the number one bad joke, which is actually not a good one, but on the internet this is supposed to be the best joke in mathematics. There's a two mathematicians they are discussing in a bar about how much mathematics do ordinary people know. One says, no, they don't know anything. The other says, oh, yes, they know more than you could think. Okay, the first one goes to the toilet. I shortened the joke here because it's not a good one. So the first one says, okay, waiter, waiter, come here, come here. I will ask you a question, and you will just say 3.14. Can you do that? And the waiter, 3.14. No, no, says the mathematician. 3.14, is that so difficult? The waiter, 3.14. Okay, so the good, 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 go away because he's coming back. Is coming back from the toilet. So blah, 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 blah. Yeah, they don't know anything. Common people, they don't know mathematics. And the other, the, the, the first person says, no, they do know, they know more than you think. They don't know more. Let's do a test. Let's call for the waiter. Call the waiter. Waiter. He says, you will see, you will see. Waiter, can you tell me what you get when you divide the circumference of a circle by the diameter? The waiter says, 3.14. Says the first mathematician, you see, you see, even the waiter knows, pi knows the formula. They are impressed. The waiter goes away and he turns around at certain time and says, But in fact, you know, in fact, it's not 3.14, but 3.14159265. So you should never underestimate waiters. <laughs> uh, cute. Six has an imaginary friend. Uh, be rational, says the number I. Get real, says Pi. <laughs> so let's summarize. What is mathematics about? 
you have three kinds of people, those who can count and those who cannot. This is a binary pseudocode. <laughs> uh, yeah, skip this one. Uh, once there was somebody who said that, well, if you have no no in mathematics, it becomes yes. This shows how mathematics is so different from ordinary life because yes, yes is never no. Somebody in the back of the room said yes, yes. <laughs> there was somebody who did logic and they asked him when he got a baby if it was a boy or a girl. He said yes. <laughs> What do we do in mathematics? We do trigonometry. The question is find x. The answer is here it is. <laughs> this we do with normally in Belgium. You do this with King Philip. I think in uh, US you do this with the vice president. So depends on the country. <laughs> Analysis x to eight yes, here is this number. So x to five is that number. If you simplify the n, then of course you get six. Uh, yes, I'm collecting jokes that uh, you can find somewhere everywhere, like the story of a constant walking in the park. There was a constant walking in the park, and suddenly it saw a derivative behind it. So it started running the constant because there was a derivative coming. And there were two x squared sitting there and said, oh, run, 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 because there's a derivative coming. Okay, they start running together. Suddenly they see somebody and said, oh, we have to run, we have to run, there's a derivative operator coming. The function was sitting on the bench and it doesn't move. He said, why don't you move? Yes, he said, I'm e to the power x. So they go on, running. He said, oh, poor guy. He shows up a lot, but he doesn't know it's a derivative with respect to y. <laughs> this was written somewhere. I want, and for the lady there, the integral of e to the power x dx. Okay. Uh, this is in German again, a romantic asymptote. Okay, the chicken is afraid of the ellipsoid egg. Linear algebra, determinant, okay. Applied mathematics, this is how nature is. This is how we mathematicians think of nature. Okay, topology, spherical cow. Once there was an engineer, a physicist, and a mathematician who were invited by a farmer to build a large fence. And he has had as much wire, barbed wire, as they wanted. So the engineer made a circular barbed wire, and the farmer said, very good, a circle, eh? biggest surface for the smallest circumference, very good. The physicist, he started by making a long straight line. Says the farmer, what are you doing? Yes, he said, you said that you had as much barbed wire as I wanted. Well, I will make the circumference of the earth. You will have half the earth. The mathematician took barbed wire and he put it around his waist. And says the farmer, I wanted to make you, to let you make the high, the, the, the largest fence, you just put the barbed wire around you. Yes, he said, the mathematician. I'm standing at the outside. <laughs> Institute of Solid Geometry, Institute of Flat Geometry. Okay, not too fast. Uh, how do we prove that all, num all numbers are prime? Math professor, three is prime, five is prime, number seven is prime, and prime number, the rest is, the rest is left as an exercise for the students. You can find a lot of theories, you just have to do it on the internet. I will not go over this because it's taking too long. Because, but since I teach for, teach for architects, this is how an architect does it. Three is prime, five is prime, seven is prime, nine. We will ask an engineer. How do the engineers do it? The engineer says three is prime, five is prime, seven is prime, nine. That's a good approximation. <laughs> and here is our some more. You also have it for a theologist. God can make any number prime if he chooses so. <laughs> so you have all kinds of things. You have to just check it out. If it's something smells bad, it's chemistry. If something moves in an awkward way on your school, it certainly comes from the biology class, isn't it? If something, if some machine there is standing somewhere and it's, there's a button and it's supposed to work but it doesn't work, then it's physics, isn't it? And if something doesn't move, doesn't smell, doesn't work, doesn't do anything, it's mathematics. <laughs> Scientists saw a zebra, a white zebra, says the biologist, hooray, we will be famous. No, says the, statist, the computer scientist, this is only a particular value of the stripe parameter. Says the statistician, oh no, we only know there's at least one white zebra among an immensity of other zebras. Says the mathematician, huh, I could even say more than that. In fact, we only know that there's one zebra that is white on one side. 
What is the difference between the mathematics department and the other departments in a university or where you teach in school? The others, they always ask a lot of money, isn't it? For the laboratory, for books, for inviting a politician, for whatever. And for mathematics, a pencil, paper, and a trash can is enough. Now, what is the difference between the philosophy? It's also true for the philosophers. But what is the difference between the mathematicians and the philosophers? <laughs> yes, in philosophy, in philosophy, they don't even need a trash can. Yes, okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. Conclusion. Where does the mathematics lead to? Philosophers, by the way, sometimes I have philosophers in the audience, then I have to calm them down. I have to say that philosophy is a game without rules, but with objectives. Well, mathematics is a game oh, uh, with rules, but without objectives. Yes, you have to be careful with the audience if there are philosophers. And first, fortunately, Christopher isn't here, Christopher. Uh, a priest, a lawyer, and a mathematician are condemned to the guilty because the true life, the true ob objective of life is of course death, as we all know. So the priest went out for his condemnation, waiting for the knife, and the guard, he pulled the rope, but the knife didn't fall off his head. So the priest stood up and he said, oh, this is the will of God, this is the will of God, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. <laughs> okay, he goes away. The lawyer goes up the stage, becomes, puts his head for the knife, the knife doesn't fall again. The guard tries, the knife doesn't fall. The lawyer stands up and says, this is the law, this is the law. You can only try once. I have been condemned, you can only try once. I'm free, I'm free. The mathematician goes up the stage and says, oh, wait a minute, I see what is wrong here. I will repair it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, three mathematicians go into a cafe and they meet the rich person and the rich person says, okay, let me invite you for a balloon trip. But suddenly they get lost and uh, the three mathematicians, well, they say, hey, oh, where are we? And they wait for a long time and after 15 minutes, somebody answers, you're lost, <laughs> says the rich man in the balloon. Well, you see, the person who answered there, that was a mathematician. Say the three mathematicians, how can you know that? You couldn't even see him. He's so far away, we don't even know where he is. Yes, says the rich man, of course. Because for three reasons. First of all, it took him a long time to answer. <laughs> Secondly, his answer was totally correct. And thirdly, his answer was totally useless. <laughs> now, this is a joke that they often tell to mathematicians. I see that Professor Takachi recognizes this joke. But if you want to defend yourself as a mathematician, you say, well, of course, now we know that you, the rich man, that you are a mathematician, or you can say a politician if you want, that you're a, man, that you're a, a, a manager, now we know that. Oh, says the manager, how can you know that? Oh, yes, you don't even know who this person is, and you already, and you already start to say that he, he is a mathematician, and you start to blame him. Because they always blame the mathematicians for the bank crisis. Okay, what is the goal for the students? They are too young to think about that, as we do. They think about passing the exams. When I have exams, I often ask my students to draw a big circle on the board, and they do it. <laughs> and then I say to the students, very well done, now you know your grade. <laughs> or sometimes I ask them to draw a big line on the board, a big horizontal line, and they do it with a lot of energy. And they say, ah, they're very proud, they stand here. Then I say, okay, you're at the door, please go. <laughs> <laughs> I see that these jokes are very popular here, so I will, I will add one that it is not on the program. Once I was, there was, a, was an oral exam with a student, and the workman passed by, the man who does little small jobs for cleaning and so on, and I said to him, Luke, his name is Luke, I said, Luke, can you bring some grass for this donkey sitting next to me here? And Luke looked at me, and the student says, please Luke, can you bring two portions of grass? We are having dinner together. <laughs> <laughs> this is on an office, you see the nail here, at some university. We're almost at the end, and maybe you were thinking this takes too long. Well, this is a joke with which I start my classes in September, in the beginning of the academic year. I tell my students the story of a dead man, of a man who was condemned to death. He was not dead yet. He had one hour to live. He had one hour to live, and the guard asked him, what can I do for you? You have one hour to live. He says the condemned person, oh, don't, don't, it doesn't matter, don't worry. He says, yes, but I can bring you a meal. 
tell me what you want. You want uh, uh, lasagna or whatever? Just tell me what you want. I said, no, don't do any efforts. No, no, no. A big stick? No, don't do any effort. I can bring you some, something to drink. Whiskey, wine, just tell me. I will smuggle it in the prison. No, no, don't do any. He says, okay, well, I'm, I'm open-minded. Maybe you want a woman, a man? Just tell me. No, don't do any effort. Should I read from a religious book or something? He says, no. Uh, but he says, no, I'm cutting it short. He says, if you really want to do something for me, for the hour that remains, just give me one hour of mathematics, says the guard. You have one hour to live, and you, the only thing you can think of is one hour of math class. Yes, says the prisoner. That time will seem to last much longer. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something you can tell your students, because if they are in your class, they enjoy life much more. So the past minutes extended your lifespan. And uh, don't forget the saying by Blaise Pascal. I could have written you a shorter letter, mathematician Blaise Pascal. I could have written you a shorter letter if I would have had more time. It's uh, actually not a joke, it's a good one. So thank you for, for your attention. And please remember this formula. And I will count to three. And on three, we will all read this formula together. And we will shout it out loud. And then we have a half an hour for the balloons. So let's read this formula. Yes, so one, two, three. Man is 